Okay, thank you. I'll share my screen. Is that shared? Yes, perfectly. Brilliant. Okay, so, um, well, this is me. Uh, I'm Janet Francis. I teach in the Department of Computing at Staffordshire University. And uh, I'm also an EdD student doing a, a doctorate in education, uh, which is why I'm here today. Um, basically, I really value having this opportunity to present my work. Uh, it's very much a work in progress, I have to say. I'm a novice at LCT, and uh, I've got to the point where I really need to know if I'm doing it right or not. So I'm really hoping for some feedback on what I've done so far and some advice actually at this stage. Uh, I really can't see the chat, so please, if you can shout up if you've got a question, that would be really good. So my talk is called Autonomy Tours in an English University. Um, and basically, you always need to have a problem, don't you? So uh, my problem is that academics are increasingly feeling that their autonomy is threatened. Uh, I mean, in the UK since the early 60s and particularly during the Thatcher era, sort of in the 80s and 90s, there are a lot of neoliberal policies promoting marketization and massification of HE, uh, the knowledge economy, um, the, the commoditization of knowledge. Um, student fees were introduced, uh, gradually increasing over the years, and this led to managerialism, to sort of a top-down management structure, uh, instead of the collegiality which we'd always enjoyed. And collegiality tends to go hand in hand with academic autonomy. So there have really been changes afoot for the last sort of 60 years, which have gradually started to erode um, academic autonomy. So in England, uh, we've had a major reform of apprenticeship policy in 2015, and it created the concept of degree apprenticeships, which I'll talk about just to provide a background so that I can then talk about the translation device I'm using, etc. Um, but these programmes essentially um, brought in other stakeholders. So we've now got external oversight from employers and regulatory bodies and uh, that potentially has the impact to further impact our academic autonomy and so my research is going to use the autonomy dimension of LCT to analyze interview data from academics involved in degree apprenticeships. So apprenticeship in the UK um, was for a very long time a poor relation compared to academic education in terms of, of government funding, et cetera. Um, but it was re-regulated in uh, 2009 for the first time in two centuries. And um, through further policy reform, it now has more funding. Uh, in 2010, higher apprenticeships were introduced and started running. And the higher apprenticeships had uh, a framework with two components. And importantly, they were at a level equivalent to the first year of a degree course. So that part of the apprenticeship, the knowledge component, could be taken in a university. So it's the first time really that um, apprentices were sort of introduced into universities, albeit as part-time students. And that's where my involvement with apprenticeship began. I never really considered myself to be sort of a, a proper academic because I came to academia after 12 years in industry. And so the idea of working with apprentices was quite seductive, really. Uh, so the, the higher apprenticeship has this knowledge component, which is a degree qualification, but it's also got a work-based component uh, which is a national vocational qualification and that's assessed in the workplace totally separately so these two components were quite separate but both of them were required uh, to make the higher apprenticeship 
So essentially an apprentice would leave with, with three certificates, one for the knowledge component, whatever that was, one for the vocational component, and then the higher apprenticeship. So just to give a, a sort of further example of that, uh, this higher apprenticeship, uh, <laughs> IC software web and telecom professionals at level four uh, has a number of knowledge components. And if you can see that screen, uh, K9 is the Staffordshire University uh, knowledge component, which is a foundation degree, which is like the second year of uh, a university degree. But there are lots of others there and they're all running at different universities or um, uh, perhaps further education colleges, some of them. Um, but those qualifications run entirely separately in those institutions and an employer can choose which one they'd like to send their apprentice to. I mean, really speaking, I suppose they send them quite locally because they're a part-time student, um, but they do have a choice. So they could actually have um, uh, a, a foundation degree or, or even a BSc, some of those are, or just a higher national certificate, which is literally the first year of a, a degree course or equivalent. And the BTEC national, sorry, Quick question. Um, I'm thinking about your jogs and going into your filter. Do, are you indicating that um, all three, no, the, sorry, the knowledge and the practical, they, are they equal in weighting or are they disproportionate? Uh, they're equal in terms of the apprenticeship because you have to have both of them. But uh, in terms of length, um, if you were doing a degree, uh, and some of those are BSc qualifications, one of them a BSc in cyber security, I notice, uh, that would probably be a three-year course, whereas a foundation degree would be a two-year course. So in terms of, of the length of study, they might be slightly different, but in terms of weighting towards the apprenticeship, they were the same. And I'm talking in the past tense here because the last apprentices on these framework apprenticeships, the higher apprenticeships, would have started last August. These have now been replaced. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so the, the next policy reform was the one of 2015, which is the one I, I want to talk about today. Um, and that raised vocational education to the level of bachelor and master's degrees for the first time. So an apprentice now can study towards a bachelor or a master's degree and it provided a fully funded vocational route to graduation through an, a payroll levy on, on large employers and those large employers can then obviously send apprentices uh, uh, to um, a university offering these apprenticeships and the funding would then come back to them or they would draw down that levy funding to pay for that course. Um, and the difference between these apprenticeships and the ones that I've just spoken about is that the workplace experience and the academic education are integrated and looked after by the university. So the university has to um, monitor the workplace experience, which is quite different to what was happening previously. And I thought it'd be useful just to, to give some idea of the apprenticeship standards. And there are 21 apprenticeship standards for digital apprentices. Uh, and those are, are sort of listed. And uh, if you can see, there are some at level four, which is equivalent to the first year of a bachelor's degree, some at level six, which would be uh, all three years. And then there's a master's level at level seven. And you can see the four at the bottom, uh, are level seven apprenticeships. Um, some of them are integrated, they've got integrated degree after them, which means that basically if you pass the degree, then you pass the apprenticeship. Uh, and some of them aren't, which means that after you've passed the degree, you would then have to take an external assessment. And there's even an apprenticeship for academics. Uh, this is real, academics can become apprentices. I could become an apprentice. Uh, so this apprenticeship is at master's level, the academic professional. It's not integrated, but it could run alongside a master's course. And some universities are offering the academic prof 
professional apprenticeship to their new or, or their existing staff. As I say, I, I could do this. There's no limit to what an apprentice could be paid, so it wouldn't mean a drop in pay. No requirement to change your job title, no age restriction. Uh, the only thing is you have to be allowed 20% of the job learning time. And um, basically it means that universities can claw back some of their levy funding because as a large employer, a university would pay a substantial amount into the apprenticeship levy. And I was really interested to know if this sort of thing exists in other countries where you can go to a university and, and take an apprenticeship. Maybe, maybe it exists in different forms. Mm, um, I think it, it yeah, probably. I, in, in, my, uh, in my country, for example, uh, you know, as you know, we have a bit of a history of, uh, of uh, apartheid. Um, and, you know, we kind of came from that. So, so one of the ways that we are overcoming that is by, um, you know, funding certain scarce skills for certain demographics. Um, and I mean, for example, myself, I came through, uh, the, uh, the path where I also came like you from, uh, industry, Curi curiously enough, also a computer scientist. So nice to see you here too. Um, so, so, you know, I, I also came in from industry, um, and then, uh, went on a three year, uh, kind of, you know, half do your academic work half kind of get trained and do your PhD and do your, uh, you know, do your study for getting actually employed. And then those three years were um, provisional in the sense that, you know, you were on a contract for those three years. And then after that, they kind of evaluate you and they say, well, you know, uh, you are uh, allowed to go through. And I haven't yet seen anyone who hasn't managed that, by the way. Uh, because that would be quite a quite an odd thing, I suppose. Um, and and then, uh, you know, you congratulations, you are now have a permanent uh, post. Um, you are a fully fledged uh, academic at the end. Now, I don't know how closely what I'm what I'm saying relates to the apprenticeships that you are describing, um, but I mean that that's a discussion that I, you know, that, that would be useful to have perhaps. Yes, so I think it would. It, it sounds very similar, doesn't it? Uh, in particular, the, the fact that you, you've said you're, you're assessed at the end of it and then congratulations, you, you get a job. Uh, that's exactly what happens to the apprentices. They, um, they don't, they're not guaranteed a job with their employer at the end of it. But of course, as you say, most of them do. It's like a long interview in many ways. But um, yeah, it sounds very similar. It'd be good to have that discussion, actually. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Can I come in here for, from teacher education also in South African context, where it's completely yeah. the opposite, um, in that work-based learning forms a part of university um, degrees, um, and it's on the basis of the university assessing work-based learning that um, qualified students are are allowed to register with the professional council. So um, it's, it's, but the responsibility for quality control and, and work-based learning and monitoring it and assessing, it's, it's um, the, the student's compact, uh, sorry, the student's um, competence in practice resides with the university, not with the employer. That's interesting. That, I mean, that does sound, uh, it sounds, yeah, in, in terms of, of these apprenticeships, there is an employer on the, the final, you know, in the degree apprenticeships, an employer would sit to watch the final presentation and would sign off. So it'd be sort of a, a joint sign off in that way. Uh, but it does sound quite similar in that the university is responsible for making sure that the, the, the workplace learning takes place and that, that it's suitable. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. That's really, really useful. So um, moving on, the, the degree apprenticeship started running in 2017 uh, in the UK. Um, and obviously no new framework apprentices now, so they're all um, <clears throat> to these new apprenticeship standards rather than frameworks. 
Um, so my research question, that's, that's the, the background, I hope, on a little bit on autonomy and, and apprenticeship. But the overarching research question that I have is that do academics perceive that the introduction of apprenticeship into universities threatens their autonomy? And if so, how and to what extent? Uh, and my investigation is quite limited, so it'd be great to hear at some point you know, how your experiences compare with, with my uh, findings. And I have to say, I've only done uh, the first step of an analysis, and that's what I'd, I'd like some feedback on. Um, but it, it'd be quite interesting to, to have that discussion. Uh, I'm choosing to base my research on perceptions of academics, which is, in a way, their sort of truths, the way that they understand and interpret the level of autonomy that they have. So that might not line up with fact, but it's what it feels like uh, to them. And it's something that's not been investigated previously in the context of degree apprenticeship. So uh, in terms of data gathering, I use an English university similar to the one uh, that I work in. And um, I've chosen to look at the digital apprenticeships and that's because uh, I um, am involved in, in digital apprenticeships and obviously I'm a computer scientist. So what I didn't want was to be talking to, to people about perhaps business apprenticeships or something like that and having to sort of grapple with an understanding of, of the the topic rather than just sort of focusing on what I needed to, to find out about autonomy. So, um, and that was the reason for that. And the university in the case study got some previous experience with, with frameworks, which is useful. Uh, and also um, they started to offer the, the new apprenticeships in 2017. Uh, so the main research tool was a, was a, a semi-structured interviews with, with 10 academics, funnily enough, um, which lasted for about an hour. And they got varying lengths of services in traditional and uh, apprenticeship involvement. I also, as part of those interviews, asked for a biographical narrative, which all of the uh, participants provided. And that just gave me an idea of their route into academia. And I thought that would be quite useful in terms of using sort of the Bordesian analysis as, as part of LCT. Um, and alongside that, a, a questionnaire about their profile in work. So did they do research, mainly teaching? Uh, what was the balance of apprenticeship work and traditional work and, and so on? Which again, I... I yeah, of course. Could, uh, just jump in quickly here, because uh, I'm finding this, this an absolutely fascinating discussion uh, because of <laughs> what you can and, and can't uh, say and what you're researching and, and, and the opposite. Uh, you see over here, the focus is precisely the opposite. It's, you know, I suppose because of our, uh, our history, it's just completely irrelevant how, how existing academics feel about it. In fact, it's probably a bit of a political hot potato to say, you know, well, you know, what do you think of these, uh, you know, new people coming through this path? Um, instead, almost the entire and exclusive focus is um, how do the people who have come through feel about the process and how can we improve the process so that those people are, are basically positioned better in some way. Um, so, you know, hearing what you're saying and, and thinking of our own context in South Africa, uh, I, I suspect that it might make an interesting counterpoint um, because we're getting the one side of the data and we've basically got the other side of the data. And, and there is some, uh, there's some really good research uh, that's being done um, Actually, I'm, I'm trying to remember her name. Maybe someone from South Africa can, can help me. Um, an academic who left and is now working at an Irish university um, with a local academic here as well uh, who came through the program. Um, and then analyzing that question about how, how do we feel as people who were in apprenticeships. Um, and, you know, putting those two halves of the data together might be just fascinating.
Yeah, I, I mean, I should really, I'd really like to catch up with you actually after after you suffer at some point, uh, you know, to, to discuss this and, and to get those details. That would be really great because it, it sounds really interesting and it is. I find it an absolutely fascinating area. I've really got quite into it now. It's always difficult to start these things off, but I am, you know, quite enthralled, which I suppose is, is useful. Um, so... Uh, Moving on to, to the analysis, really, and this is where I got a big question mark where to start. Um, I mean, it was absolutely terrifying because you transcribe the interviews and so much useful information is there. And it's a question of how to sort of organize it all. Uh, and I used NVivo to code the data and there are 24 themes and I'm still counting them. I'm still coming across new things as, as I look through further. So I've started to group them in the next few slides. Uh, show the story so far but I, I think of LCT as my what I call parachute uh, because it sort of just it just sort of helped me to sort of not sink too deeply into the the quagmire of um, what I transcribed so it's um, it has been quite useful so uh, just a, a quick recap on the autonomy dimension, because I, I know what it's like. I've, I've attended these and people talk about semantics. And I, um, you know, I feel as if they're talking a different language. So just, just to, to quickly go through this. So um, the autonomy is basically a mention of the insulation of aspects of a practice uh, and those aspects are termed constituents and relations. And the autonomy codes are the positional autonomy, which is the PA. And uh, that's a measure of how insulated the constituents in the home category um, uh, that we're, we're sort of looking at are from those in another category. And relational autonomy, which measures how insulated the relationships between constituents in the home category are from those with constituents in other categories. And it draws heavily on the work of Carl Martin and Sarah Howard. By the way, I, I can't believe that I never noticed that PA <laughs> RA could be turned into para. That's, um, that's, uh, uh, that's like one of those, oh, I can't believe I didn't <laughs> say that. That's just so obvious now I see it. Oh, yeah, nice one, well done. Yeah, well, it helped me to sort of remember it in the in, in the early stages, and you know, it just sort of jogged my memory. So it was really very useful. <laughs> anyway, well so I did not see that <laughs> at all. Um, that's that's a new one on me. <laughs> good, good. So um, I had to adapt all of that um, into you know to suit my my scenario basically, and so the premise is that I'm looking at the knowledge building practice of academics and their perceptions of autonomy in that practice. So the PA uh, is the perceptions of legitimation in terms of the constituents, and the constituents are things such as curriculum content, award portfolio, and module content. And it's a question really of who decides what content is legitimate. You know, is it the academic themselves uh, in terms of academic structures, etc., or is it from outside of that? And then the RA is the perception of legitimation in terms of relations. So the ways of working, pedagogic, pedagogic practice and monitoring of performance. Who defines the rules that influence the ways of working? <laughs> And um, sorry for that. I've just muted that person. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was uh, my slide transition. <laughs> anyway, um, so again, trying just to to think of this in in terms of the um, the autonomy plane. So I've got these four quadrants, and the sovereign is um, the uh, university. Uh, where the course content and the academic practice are legitimized basically by the internal university values. Uh, and then the enterprise section, the interjected codes, are where the course content is legitimized by external partners, uh, but academic practice is legitimized by internal university values. Um, the corporation 
as I've called it, is the exotic codes, where basically the university is running a course whose content and ways of working are legitimised by external organisations. And um, the franchise is where a university design course is run by, uh, run by an autonomous organisation with its own internally legitimised practices. So that sort of helped me to get to grips with what these codes meant and I hope that that sort of makes sense because uh, other things are, are based on that. Um, so moving on to the translation device uh, and I have to say this is about the nth <laughs> iteration of this but I have got it to the point where it's been quite helpful in, um, in going through uh, the research and, and sort of trying to, to quantify it in some way. Um, can I just legitimate, um, can I just, you know, back up and legitimate your, the, the fact that you spent so much time uh, and, you know, done so many iterations? Because one of the things that a lot of people don't understand about translation devices is that they are pretty much coterminous with the project. In other words, you don't really, really finish your translation device until you've actually finished your work, until you've done you've written it up and you've finished and you've sort of sent it off. And at that point, the translation device is sort of done. It's not, a lot of people seem to misunderstand and think that it's you take the theory and then you translate it into something that can access data and that's it, it just sits there. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, some people have, you know, often, sometimes people have said to me, oh, you know, um, don't I need a translation device to start research? And you go, no, 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 not at all. Uh, just you know, you build it as you go, you refine it. You might start with one that's rough and ready. Did you start with one that's rough and ready, Janet? Yeah, I did. But, and it's nothing like this, funnily enough. It's, well, it is, no, no, but, exactly, you know, it's exactly. changed a lot. <laughs> yeah, and it should, because they come from a kind of ping pong, a kind of bouncing back and forward between the theoretical concepts and the data, and you keep moving back and forward, back and forward between them until you kind of bridge, until the translation device kind of bridges that gap and or you run out of time and money um uh, and you just have to make the best of the bridge you know the best bridge that you can uh, let's not yeah. forget that you know research is brought to the public through running out of time and deadlines and you know um and that sort of thing as well but yeah it's that bouncing back and forth so yeah a lot of people and this is really to to everybody i'm speaking rather to you uh, uh, specifically is that I would always say, you know, you've got a, you can have a vague idea when you start, and that's pretty good, but you, re, you rewrite, you revise that translation device all the time, and I mean, hopefully less and less as you go on. But, um, I mean, and that's the case, not just for specific translation devices like yours, but, but also, um, you know, the big, the big generics that, that Jaken and I work on now and again, they, they, they get changed right up to the last second. So, Mm -hmm. Can I just ask a really minor, absolutely pointless question? Yeah. Which is why you use the word legitimized rather than legitimated. And I'm asking it because somebody's kind of asked you that at some point. You know, why, what's the difference between the two? You know, I, I really don't know. And I even, I started to ask myself, is that actually a word, legitimized or legitimated? There's, um, really, there's no <laughs> difference between the two. The only thing is that I would suggest legitimated at least kind of connects to the title of the theoretical framework. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go with that then, because it, it sounded like a very clunky word to me, not legitimated, legitimized. And, but I, it, the word legitimated didn't come <laughs> so now that you've presented that one to me it probably sounds a lot less clunky <laughs> thank no, you for that I, uh, just just maybe jump in with um you know something here um i, I don't know if this is a question for for uh, carl or, or if it's a question for janet um but you know it's just something that pops into my head there's similarity between otherwise unrelated translation devices imply some underlying and perhaps hidden similarity in the uh, fields being studied. And, and it would be interesting to, to, to have an opinion or, or know about that, I mean, what people's thoughts are, because if so, then, then perhaps that is a level of abstraction that relates previously unrelated fields, much as categories in mathematics uh, relate uh, what seem to be totally different 
uh, fields such as algebra and topology. And that, that, that's probably way too big a, a question for today. So you know what, actually just, I'm just gonna, maybe I'll just throw that out and just there, it's, it's, it's on the unexploded mine and you guys can all step in it whenever you feel like it. It's interesting though, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm it not sure though. how to answer it, but it is interesting. Yeah, good. So um, in this translation device, then I've, I've um, we'll take legitimated there. So um, basically, the academic or non-academic university managers uh, and related to academic subject benchmarks and graduate skills. Um, if the constituents are legitimated by by that sort of process, then that's what I'm calling my target, uh, and that is the the sovereign, if you like, um, and then. If external bodies are involved in that, that's the sort of that's where it moves into the sort of non-target fields. And you'll notice that I've gone to a, a third level here. And the reason that I've done that is to take account there are some very minor variations um, in terms of what people were saying. And I wanted to make sure that that didn't sort of distort the overall picture too much. So I sort of took it down to a, a third level so I could cater for that. Um, so the second level is, is just dividing up uh, the university bit really into people who are academics and people who are not. So it's still academic, um, it's still university uh, when we're in the sort of ancillary, um, but it's actually um, non-subject management. So non-subject related, which is slightly further away, you know, from, from uh, the, the sort of sovereign, but still within that field that quadrant. Um, so then when we move down, uh, we're moving down into um, the external world. And that was really difficult to, to come up with. But I thought it'd be quite important to consider the value chain at that point. So I started to think in terms of apprenticeship and I thought, well, the employers are not academics, but they're on the direct value chain. So they stand to benefit from the apprenticeship. And also, if they're an employer in sort of the computing industry, the IT industry, then what they're going to suggest in terms of curriculum uh, is probably quite useful for, for content for a, a course. So it's not too far away from that. And then in the unassociated, I went to people who, uh, organizations who are not on the direct value chain. Uh, so they indirectly benefit. So people like, for example, the government or, or QA, um, associations so they you know they don't directly benefit from from that and then moving into the third level I just sort of tried to move to a, a level of granularity so uh, I split the academics into academic award teams and the academic line management um, and perhaps sort of award managers and, and module leaders people who've got some level of, of seniority in terms of content management and then the university non-subject was into the sort of school or faculty depending on how it's managed um, management uh, and then the university management and when I looked at the sort of uh, associated and the near and remote I thought a way of separating that would be to think well are there any degrees of freedom in terms of um, uh, or, or collaboration in terms of content decisions and if there is some some collaboration or some degrees of freedom, then that takes it sort of closer to the target. And uh, whereas if there isn't, then it takes it further away. So that's how I sort of divided that up. So um, again, I've used the structures that uh, Carl and, and Sarah uh, put forward for the translation device. So that's that's the translation device, and the relational autonomy one is the same. Uh, but just looking at ways of working uh, rather than content. So, so that's what I'm working with throughout this. Um, hi, Janice. It's Natalie here from the LCT. Hi. Hello. Hi. hi. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for looking at your translation device. It's, it's so similar to the one I'm working on at the moment. So we should hook up and um, have a little chat. Yes. <laughs> like, can I just go back to the, the PA device? Because um, I'm looking at autonomy in assessment design and assessment decisions. 
and I was really struggling regarding the constituents and whether the academic themselves um, were the target. And I notice here that your target, the constituent you label as the curriculum, etc. Mm. So did you struggle with whether the constituents were people or things as in curriculum? Because I've been, I, I'm looking at um, individual academic autonomy and influence over mm. assessment. And then also again, external body influence over assessment. And I've been having a debate about whether the academic can be a field in themselves. And there's so many contested professional identities within that academic, if you like. Um, but this seems a nice way to avoid that conversation about whether the academic is an agent in a field or whether the academic is a field in itself, because the constituents are not the who, they are the what. And I just thought that was a nice mm. way of doing it, whether that's been done by other people before. I've changed this so many times, you know, I actually can't remember how it started out. I must go back through my notes and have a look. So I'm, I'm sure it's interesting to, to go back to what I started with, but I've literally just, and, and what happens when you start to, to go through the data, or at least this is what happened to me, is that you just change things because you think, hang on a minute, how am I going to, to classify that? And, you know, from that, things change. And so you, you know, you, you sort of look at the data that you've got and then look at your translation device. Um, so I, yeah, I must look back and, and see how that actually started out. But um, yeah, yeah, we, we must hook up because it's always useful to talk about these things, I think. I'd be um, happy to, uh, if people are, are working on autonomy and um, want to uh, chat about that, you know, they, uh, I'd be happy to mm. uh, organize the time to, um, to, you know, discuss nascent work um, on that. And it's a really good question, Natalie, because, I mean, um, the code concepts are defined at a mind-bogglingly abstract level. So people don't realize just how abstract the code concepts are because we can easily slip into giving concrete examples of NOAA codes and knowledge codes and, you know, things like um, stronger and weaker semantic gravity and things like that. Um, they can have this sort of intuitive, you can sometimes get a kind of intuitive sense of what they might play out as in various places. It can give us a, a full sense of just how close to any specific empirical reality those concepts are. In fact, because their, their, their power is their ability to reach across so many different domains and so many different uh, objects of study and so many different questions and forms of data. But when you actually go back and look at how they're, they're defined as concepts, they are mind-bogglingly abstract. And that's why you can have so many different things. That's why those bits where in the autonomy papers where I try and define PA and RA, the first definitions are always really excruciatingly painful. Uh, before I start being able to give examples because those first ones are really, you know, they're the kind of theoretically pure version where you're not getting anywhere close to any kind of objective study because there's so many things it could be, you know. I mean, I think mm. in the definitions I say it could be machine parts, you know, it could be sounds in music, it could be or sounds in a film or it could be, you know, body movements or whatever. It's so incredibly fluid so yes which one of these things is right for your translation device or for your object of study it really depends on the the object of study and the questions you're asking and then what makes sense in the analysis and that kind of is just a little explanation so janice given and your question that is given a fantastic chance for me to just jump in and say you know that's why target is so abstract that's why pa and ra are defined in such abstract ways and it's not because I have, you know, a, a love of writing painful prose. It's more that they are so able to be used. They're so able to be used for so many different things. And so whether you choose to use them for people or, um, you know, and, and choose the, and, and there being different beliefs inside them, we can discuss that in a, in a, in a chat at some point. You might be able to do that. I mean, that could be possible. That's, 
it might be yes. that that's the best way for you is to think of I mean I wouldn't say a person is a field field for me has the Borgerian meaning of field and anyone who tries to use the word field for an individual is not understanding field because it's a socially mm. emergent phenomenon but I do I think I get what you mean that the person can have a whole range of things going on inside them because we are we are legion we are many inside ourselves and so on so I get what you mean by that and it could be that the constituents you know the target is the I don't know but we can have a chat about that but it does show you oh. just how how fluid those concepts can be and how many things mm. they can be used for and the only there's yeah. no, the only way the only wrong way really is is if you're not really explicit and that's why translation devices are so important again they're not made because I love the concepts but they're made because that gives you a chance to say here right now this is what we're going to use this for as you've just done Janet so thank you very much and thanks for the question Nancy it's awesome thank you it is it is useful and it would be really useful to talk about it because it it is uh, mind-boggling at times so um yeah early realizations um so when i started to actually look through the the transcriptions i realized that um there were things that would affect perceptions of autonomy and uh, sometimes you feel so stupid that you haven't thought about these things before but um the first one was seniority and contract so for example you know people on different types of contracts um people who are hourly paid are going to have different perceptions of, of their involvement in decision making and perhaps people who are module leaders or award leaders well you know they can make decisions that perhaps people who aren't can't so that was the the first thing and then there was this sort of level of involvement with traditional and apprenticeship work so when I was talking about um, I mean I have looked at traditional and apprenticeship work because I wanted to see the difference in autonomy between the two and you know, obviously some people were more able to comment more on traditional work and some people commented more on apprenticeship work. So I have to sort of phrase questions and drill down into to things just to give people a, a chance to, to comment on things that they, they were, were comfortable with and, and knew about. Um, but the thing that threw me most was the timeline of practice um, because things have, have happened and I've explained some of the things that have happened uh, in terms of, of traditional work but things also happened with apprenticeship work as well that sort of really affected autonomy and and um, and really people would sort of refer to those and people referred back and then talked about the current day so I realized there was actually this sort of timeline a practice that was important and so what I had to do was to sort of go and make notes based on, you know, my participants and, and their length of involvement uh, so I could actually situate them and, and work out what, what sort of time period they were talking about. So in terms of the, the timeline for, for traditional delivery, the thing that, that came out most was the fact that um, the, the students had started at some point to, to pay uh, and to pay lots of money um, and if we can just look at some of these participants for example uh, Ashley um, has obviously worked pre-2004 and actually they they came on board probably 20 odd years ago so they were able to sort of reflect back as was Aubrey to times before students had to pay huge amounts of fees and before university league tables etc um, whereas people such as Frankie at the bottom are, are very recent joiners uh, to HE and could only really comment on the current day. Uh, I've put sort of the student fees that were charged in this column here. You can see that people have got various experience. Some people just came on board uh, when students were paying sort of £9,000 a year, which is sort of tripling fees, uh, whereas other people can sort of refer back to later. So you know that that turns out to be actually quite important but it was something that i really just hadn't thought about at all uh, so i thought it'd be quite useful just to to go through what some people had said and how i classified those things uh, just as an idea so this is from uh, ashley and um, Ashley, I think, 
uh, has been in higher education for a very long time. And so a lot of the time they were reflecting back. And uh, they're also an award manager, which meant they got a certain level of um, seniority. So this is looking to the past. So I grouped those two, sorry, I should have said that. The yellow is the reflection on past and the current, which starts in sort of 2012, is um, the sort of fee paying generation. So Ashley has been in HE for, for some while, uh, for, for a certain level of time, and um, so looks back. So with my time as an award manager for traditional awards, really it was quite autonomous to introduce new modules. So, you know, new modules, new module content, etc. felt quite autonomous. But then uh, Ashley was an award leader, so was able to make those decisions. So rather being a plus four, which would mean that uh, an academic person, any academic, could make those decisions. It would need to be discussed with an award manager. So Ashley was in that promoted, not promoted position necessarily, but in that position of authority there. And so I've given that a plus three. But then Ashley talks about appraisals. They were quite broad brush. Typically, if you've been there for a long time, they just trusted you to know what you were doing as such in terms of academic practice. And trust is a theme that's emerged and I need to look into it a lot more. But a lot of people mentioned it, the fact that there the seemed in, in the current day to be a, a lack of trust, for example. Um, so essentially, Ashley was trusted to make decisions relating to practice along with others who were also trusted uh, if they'd been there for a certain amount of time. So I put RA4 uh, for that sort of thing. And moving to the current uh, and the participant Alex. So this is talking, it's, it sounds very different. I think I'd have to appease at least two or three people and at least one committee just to get permission to look at it. And they were talking about a new award at that point. Uh, this suggests a hierarchy above the academic departmental management. They're perhaps not as high as university management. So I put it at a plus two. I think I was probably being a bit, a bit generous there. But, uh, and then uh, in terms of the uh, relational autonomy, our current management structure is a bit more micromanaging. I don't think there's as much flexibility or autonomy as we used to have 10 or 20 years ago. And again, it suggests there's sort of a, a centralised hierarchy rather than uh, just satisfying departmental requirements. So again, I put a, a plus two. So in terms of the um, traditional mapping using that translation device, and obviously I, I've got um, a lot more uh, trans translations than, than just the, the two that we've covered there, so the yellow dots are for the reflection on the past and so you can see that they're sort of clustered and where the two are quite close together i've just sort of separated them a little bit so you can see there are actually two there uh, and so that was sort of where they turned out to be which is really very well embedded into the university quadrant the sovereign codes and that's the past one jump in a little bit on the theory here yeah because um i mean it's probably my own uh, misunderstanding but you know one of the nice things about uh, this particular forum is that if it is my own misunderstanding mm -hmm. someone will undoubtedly jump up and say hang on what are you doing so but it so might be mine that's the thing <laughs> <laughs> well we'll see we'll see we'll see. Yeah. see of relational autonomy right is that a relation like like a way of working or a, a, a aim or purpose or something like that is autonomous if it serves the purposes of the discipline um but but here when you are talking about relational autonomy it seems to be more about whether a person has autonomy to make decisions related to their own practice I think, so I'm wondering, yeah, and I, mm, are those two the same thing? They're obviously similar and they're obviously related, those two things. Yeah, but and uh, I've, I've, taught, I've wrestled with this very same thing myself. And uh, what I came to the conclusion was, and 
and there is still a debate in my mind about this, but it is perceptions. And if somebody is in the sovereign code, and you know, some people might not be, this is where the debate comes in, and they are able to make those decisions, then those would be sovereign code type decisions. Um, and that's a, a stretch. Uh, but, you know, these people are working in university and they're working towards university values. And, you know, so if they've got the autonomy to, to make those decisions, then hopefully those decisions will be within that code. And it is a stretch and it is something that I've wrestled with. So, you know, it's useful that you've, you've also thought that. And again, time for discussion. So, so I mean, in the same way that you kind of pinned your 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 pa um mm -hmm. you know may, may, maybe um i don't know maybe i missed it because i would um but but then then if you pin your ra um to basically this is these are the the values what we consider of a traditional university then that kind of gives you that, that fixed point for your translation is that does that make sense mm. is that what you're doing yeah yeah it does okay. Um, and, you know, the thing is that there are sort of 10 people here. Well, not in each case, obviously, some people were able to comment on the past, others weren't. But, you know, I suppose um, having that granularity and, and interviewing 10 people gives some level of... And, the, yeah. and, I, I, and there I, are I differences. That the idea of, of the broad um, uh, consensus within the field, is that... Mm. Yeah, you know, if I'd interviewed one person, then, you know, that person could have perhaps not necessarily been themselves in a, a sovereign code. And so that one person then might have, have completely skewed things. And you can see there are, there are some differences in opinion really here, you know, in, in those green dots. They're not all in one place. Uh, you know, people have got various opinions of, of uh, various perceptions, should I say, of how things are, are running there. Uh, but crucially, they are all in that sovereign code. They're all, you know, they've, they all perceive that they've got that level of autonomy. And um, I mean, if they were, for example, from the end, if they in themselves perhaps were more from the enterprise code and, and wanted to, to relate more to that, perhaps they'd have perceived things differently and, and things would have been uh, elsewhere. It's an interesting point, it really is. And as I say, it's something that I've wrestled a little bit with. Right, It'd be cool. interesting to discuss well, thank that you further. That, that, that includes this chapter, I think, of uh, two <laughs> computer scientists debating between each other with an audience of non-computer scientists. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know, we computer don't computer know, computer that's, a, that, <laughs> that's a stretch. I'm sure there are some, some out there. Right, so, so you know, I've, I've just put circles around these to try to sort of just bring a broader area. Um, and so that's the current, and we can see that there's a sort of autonomy drift. And, you know, that Janet, drift it's, has it's, been... It's, it's, Janet, because of the, the, there's been a couple of, a few minutes, can you just remind us, that, so the past and the current are students... Right. No, <laughs> remind us. The past and the current are um, the reflection on the past is yeah. sort of before student loans came right, in. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, so before we really had this concept of the student as the paying customer and league tables and the managerialism, intense yeah. managerialism that came from that. And then the current is the, the present day where right. students are paying, you know, 9,000, upwards of 9,000 a, a year. On so when we, when you're, what you're showing there, I think, is that these, uh, these people are seeing a, a coach a, a code drift due to these changes is that right yeah that would be a, a way of interpreting it i think that was certainly my thought that you know whereas they were very strongly in the sovereign code in the past things have sort of moved slightly over a period of possibly 20 years um and they've got sort of a little bit um a little bit less sovereign but still well within that that sort of quadrant that's that's my interpretation of it and so it's sort of a very very slow drift but still very much on the home turf as it were 
Good. So the next thing is to move on to apprenticeship, because I also want to, to do that comparison. So the apprenticeship phases that emerged from the data were more characterised by policy changes than fees, because the apprentices don't actually pay the fees. Um, and so phase one was the old framework delivery, which the university had been involved in. Uh, phase two was the change to apprenticeship standards and the uh, incoming degree apprenticeships, so uh, apprentices in, in the university and the university being responsible for them, whereas in the framework delivery, if you remember, um, that was quite separate, so the apprentices were literally part-time students. Uh, and then phase three was when an organisation called Ofsted, uh, which is the Office for Standards in Education, uh, and it's generally more associated with, with school education. They were appointed uh, as the Quality Assurance Agency uh, for apprenticeships. So there are three phases. First of all, the, the framework phase, and they overlap a little bit, but the framework phase is where it was really just apprentices as part-time students in the university. Um, phase two was the degree apprenticeships, and then when phase three comes in, that is when uh, Ofsted started to become involved. So we've got uh, participant Pat here uh, for apprenticeship phase one. And um, the interesting thing about this is if you look at the codes, it's very similar and in fact, it, very similar and, and almost the same as just for the traditional courses because essentially they were uh, traditional courses so they could they could decide they could make decisions on on module descriptors um, and uh, Pat is an academic who doesn't have responsibilities and, and found they had to ask the award manager if they could change some modules but there weren't any issues they didn't perceive that to be a, a massive problem and they seem to have the freedom in terms of pedagogical style now, the interesting thing was, reading through the transcriptions, is that people involved in apprenticeships at that time actually felt they had more autonomy in terms of decision-making and practice in the apprenticeship work than they did for the traditional work because it was less visible. One of the themes that came out was that the apprenticeship work was very much seen as, you know, just something else that other people did. And there were just a few people who were involved in it at the time. And, um, you know, so there was less interest in it and, you know, less monitoring, I suppose. So, you know, that was quite an interesting thing that came out. In apprenticeship phase two, um, Sam is talking about introjected codes. Um, and we talk about these KSBs, which are knowledge, skills and behaviours, which are essentially the apprenticeship outcomes. Am I limited by the KSBs? Yes, I am. Uh, they're suitably woolly in many areas, so you can take some liberties with what is written. But I do think you are limited by what you're prescribed to do by those outcomes. And so that takes us into, um, because it's the KSBs are produced by the employer. So it takes us into the, um, the interjected codes. But because there's a, a little bit of liberty there, a little bit of freedom of choice. I've put it as a minus one rather than a minus um, two. But in terms of the um, in terms of, of the teaching and the, the ways of working, you know, I think I've got the freedom to pretty much do as I want to do. I use an approach I've found over many years and adapt and vary the technique to suit the body of students. So things might be done differently. Uh, because we've got a different body of, of students. But actually, it's what you do as a teacher or a lecturer. You would change how you work dependent on the body of students, and that would be down to you to choose that. And these are part-time students, so perhaps slightly different. So I put the RA plus four for that. And then for apprenticeship phase three, uh, Lee is feels pretty much in the exotic codes. Uh, phase three is where Ofsted came in. Um, and these are British values. 
and this is the prevent agenda. This is this, this is this, and 20 minutes later, you actually start to deliver. So British values and the prevent agenda are things that Ofsted require uh, you to teach for, uh, apprentices about. Nothing to do with um, the target learning. Uh, it's defined by the regulatory body, not related to the topic. And I put minus four for that, because if you look at the second thing that Lee has said, Ofsted said, actually, we need to track and monitor the students to make sure they're progressing and on top of their target. At the end of the day, Ofsted are the regulators. And if you don't do what a regular wants, you're unsatisfactory and nobody wants to come. So unsatisfactory is a grade that Ofsted would give to an organisation. And, you know, that would potentially uh, remove the licence from that organisation to deliver. So it wouldn't necessarily be that, be that people don't want to come, but you just wouldn't be able to deliver the courses again. So I've put, again, minus four for that. So those are just examples. And obviously other people have, have commented. So again, we've got phase one, uh, which is our framework apprenticeships. And uh, if we look at where they are, they're right in, in the top corner again, uh, similar to where um, the traditional started off 20 years ago and people just felt they had more freedom because the the apprenticeships were less visible at that time so if we look at phase two when the um standards came in which were employer written we notice that they go into the enterprise codes uh there and so we've actually got a, a code shift from the um sovereign codes to the interjected codes and then if we look about Phase three, when Ofsted uh, started to, to quality assure the courses, you can see that we've moved into the corporation codes where people didn't feel that they had a lot of choice, particularly, um, particularly in terms of, um, well, particularly in terms of the, the ways of working, but also, and I think some people remembered that they'd been forced to teach British values and prevent, sorry, force is perhaps a strong word, but uh, some people felt that remembered about that, whereas other people just thought about uh, all the monitoring that they needed to do uh, and felt that they still had some control over generally what they teach, um, uh, perhaps just forgetting about the, the prevent agenda and so on. So, um, so we can see there that, that, again, there's another code shift, and this is sort of a, a one-way autonomy tour uh, and I think the thing that's very striking about this is that if we sort of look at the time scale there it's literally from 2007 onwards uh, we seem to have moved first of all into the um, introjected codes and then into the the exotic codes in the space of sort of four years uh, whereas in the traditional teaching, we're still very much in the uh, sovereign codes, even after 20 years. So it's, and it's all been very sudden, very swift, and uh, very much a, a one-way trip, I think. And, uh, you know, obviously, it's going to be very interesting to look at, uh, and there is a lot of, of data in, in, in my transcriptions about how people feel about that, and I can relate that to where they've come from, their backgrounds and, and various other things. So it's, it's going to be a very uh, drawn out process, I think, but a very interesting process to sort of go through that. So just to remind you of that tour. And then this is the point where I finish the uh, presentation and ask for your questions and comments. Um, Thanks, Janet. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, please, people, just um, feel free to. Uh, hang on, sorry, I didn't start my video. Do feel free to um, uh, to sort of jump in. Um, people don't have to worry about um, you know the. When we first started this, we were uh, uh, Zoom was just crashing endlessly because everybody was trying to go online as the pandemic hit. But nowadays, um, that is not a problem. So I don't feel bashful about you know uh, jumping in, putting a camera on, un, uh, unmuting yourself, and um, 
and, and you know asking questions or, or coming up with any uh, uh, anything at all I'd be interested to um, I'll be interested as well to hear what other people have made of autonomy or or they're doing in their work sorry I'll just relay this to you Janet and Marnell uh, Mouton from Stellenbosch in South Africa has uh, just said thanks for great talk and she has to run right. thank you Janet, so it's Lee here from um, from Johannesburg. Uh, one of the things that's that's been uh, I've noticed in my institution is certainly how people sometimes have the responsibility to make decisions, but not the authority to do so. Um, and I was wondering if that in any way kind of manifested in 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 your um, in your data where. Um, you know, people are expected to contribute and so on, but not actually have the authority to to make those those decisions mm. at the end of the day. I mean, it did, and to some extent, I, I took account of some of that because you know people would say, "Well, I I can change this, but I need to check it with the award leader." And award managers would say, "Well, you know, I can change this," and I would have to take account of the fact that they're actually in that position where they're allowed to, uh, to make sure that it, it didn't sort of skew the code. But yeah, there were other things where there, there was a lot of, of discussion about um, people trying to, to meet um, the demands of uh, the traditional uh, monitoring, as well as the apprenticeship monitoring. So an interesting thing is that the apprentices uh, will fill out something that we have, which is the National Student Survey, um, which is another sort of, I suppose, monitoring device because the outcome of that goes into to leak tables, which are very important. And so that's taken into account by senior management and, and brought down. And so apprentices will fill that out as well as, um, you know, we have to take account of what Ofsted requires to do. And sometimes, taking account of what Ofsted requires us to do puts us at odds with the National Student Survey. So people, you know, apprentices will say that, oh, we haven't done this, or we have done this, or we've made them do that. And we've made them do that because we've had to do that because of the Ofsted requirements. So we're sort of caught in a sense, and I'm talking as my personal involvement at Staffordshire here, we're sort of caught between, uh, you know, two masters, if you like, really, the, the sort of traditional side of things and the apprenticeship side which the apprentices kind of both fall under but sort of don't does that answer that question <laughs> hey thanks thank, thank, thanks very much janet could i ask another question i don't want to hog <laughs> <laughs> no it's good it's in, good to chat in, in my in my research, and I'd love to present it around table, I think I probably should quite soon. Um, I'm trying also to uh, look at the influence um, over assessment design, rather than uh, maybe synonymous with control, because you've got issues around policy that can say who can control assessment, but then there are issues around who has the greatest influence over assessment. And um, I'm also finding a separation between what academics think should happen and what does happen. So theory and mm -hmm. practice, and I'm looking at that divide. And um, again, plotting that on the autonomy plane to separate out. So theory might be sovereign, but practice might be exotic, for example. Um, did you find any comments that relayed that split? So this is how it's done at the moment, which I assume is what you plotted, the actual practice. Mm -hmm. I think that I should have more control over mm. the curriculum, et cetera. And how did you deal with that? Um, well, this is an interesting point that you brought up because there, there's an awful lot of data. And one of the questions that I have, I think, for Carl, and it sort of relates to what you've just said, is can you actually have two sets of autonomy codes relating to the same data? Because there is this, there is another sort of, there is other stuff coming out that I could have chosen as autonomy codes. Absolutely. I mean, like there's, there's the, 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 I think, I think the, the nature of LCT concepts as being there to solve a problem. 
is nowhere more apparent than in autonomy. Um, they are not, they never have been and never will be there for the description of things, merely. They are not relabeling of anything empirical, except for the purposes of an explanation of a particular public situation. So yes, there's not like, these are the autonomy codes in this data. You could attack the data from a different angle with a different question, for example, so for me, I use the words problem situation, which I've sort of borrowed from Popper to describe the kind of the object of study, the, the sort of form of data, the, the object of study, the form of data and the question. And if you change any of those things, then, um, you know, you could see something completely different. So, I mean, you can have more than one set of autonomy codes, even with the same problem situation. So for example, when we're analyzing classrooms, the teacher's target was not necessarily the same as the students or the students mm, targets interesting, yeah. and if we were interested in a different set of questions about say for example student engagement if we were interested in student engagement rather than in the teacher so we were analyzing it we were analyzing teaching we were interested in the teaching um, primarily the teaching and the learning as displayed through classroom practice anyway in classroom discourse if we had been interested, so, so we took the teacher as the, the basis of the target, but if we were attacking the same data, if we were looking at the same data with uh, same classroom data with, with the issue of classroom, you know, student engagement in mind, we might have uh, gone in there and, and asked students about um, um, their, uh, their various, uh, you know, way they saw what they wanted to get out of the lesson or whatever it would be, or maybe you'd have some sort of instrument that would get at that. And then you would find that, you know, some students wanted to learn whatever it might be. They might want to learn history for the purpose of, you know, passing the exam in history or whatever. But there might be some who are like, Ugh, whatever, you know, I just want to get through it and get out and go home or something like that. Their target would not be the same target as the teacher's target. And therefore, you know, um, so that, I mean, the thing about um, autonomy and the reason why target is so important is because like a comp you know like there's no up down left or right on the plane you have to fix it that's why you say for this purpose for these questions with this data for this explanation i'm fixing the target as here and then everything will flow from it now if you fix the target somewhere else you will get a different set of codes now that is not contradictory in any way shape or form because the codes serve the explanation and if anybody says oh here's the data you know what are the codes i'm like i don't have a fucking clue because it depends upon what your question is what you're trying to achieve you know you have to fix a target so there's this kind of we have to get our heads around the fact that um and this is what i made a a, a big emphasis on in the version of um autonomy tours that appears in the book teaching science here's a little advertisement it's just about to come out in the next couple of weeks um you know um uh you, you know by you know you'll, you'll change your life but in that version i've really emphasized that autonomy allows us to sail a course between the you know the silent charybdis of essentialism and relativism by which i simply mean the notion that um things are what they are and nothing else or that it's all a mess that you can't say anything about anything you know, so there's the, the, those are the two things that we tend to fall into is like, oh, it's a description. It has to be this way. The, you know, the, um, the, 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 the sovereign code is this always here um, or, or it's or it can be anything. The, um, and I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, but just to explain that and then let, uh, get out of this. The reason why it was important for me in the, the studying of maths and science is because what's maths, what science changes uh, through the course of a curriculum and maths becomes science. So maths gets scientized, mm -hmm. it gets folded into science. So there's no bloody way of telling what is maths and what is science and when maths becomes science. And none of the work on it actually makes any effort to look at that. They just kind of, they say, they say it as if it's self-evident. All the articles just say as if it's self-evident what's maths and what's science, particularly when maths becomes science, you know? So uh, we had sort of two ways, two ways that this tends to fall into. It's like, it's obvious what is maths, it's obvious what is science, or maths and science are anything you want at which point you can't say anything about anything. And the way in which target works for me, and I think target is the key concept of autonomy, is that it says, this is what it is here right now, and then we can draw codes from that. And then we can make an explanation. And it's the same in all these objects of study. You know, that so many things could be different. 
So if you were if you were looking at your data from another angle, you might say, okay, my you know what I'm interested in is these people and what they're doing and what their beliefs are about this, and that's different to what I was previously looking at. So for those people in this context, for these reasons, their what they consider as the target here is now X, it's not Y. So you can have, you know, you can use the same concepts to analyze the same data set with a different question and you would get different codes. And that is not at all contradictory because the codes are there simply to serve to create an explanation. And I don't think that any other dimension is so wonderfully clear in my mind anyway, about, or at least its implications in my mind anyway, uh, uh, so clear uh, in its sort of the, the kind of pure LCT way of thinking there, which is, you know, it's all about serving an explanation. Mm. It is never about theoretical fetishism. It's never about this is, you know, a sovereign code. No, that can't be a sovereign code because this is a sovereign code. It depends on what angle you're taking. And that doesn't mean that it's anything goes because once you fixed and you fixed it with your translation device, then you can see what the other codes are, you know? So, um, yeah, so that's a very long answer. <laughs> to your question which could be answered with just yes <laughs> no it's really useful because i you know i've identified another set of autonomy codes uh, as well as some specialization codes as well and you know i just suddenly thought can you actually do that but that's really that's really useful and i think in answer to natalie's question which is where this started off yeah i mean i, I have come across that that's come out and that's something that I need to try to visualize. I find the visualization that autonomy provides is, is great. You can sort of see what's happened. Um, you know, it sort of shows the, the movement and gives some indication of, of how far some things moved away from, from the target, really. Kareem wants to ask a question. Kareem, jump in. Kareem? Oh, no, she was, oh, there she is. We're not hearing you. Ah, oh, the wonders of Zoom. <laughs> no. There you go. Yeah. Are we there yet? Yes, we are now. You are, we can hear okay. you. Okay. All right, different cable. Um, I was going to just connect to precisely what you've been talking about and what um, I think, I can't remember who it was, way on earlier said something about the, the, the mathematical nature or the, the, the field that comes from, um, and which is why I so relate. And I found this really, really uh, useful, Janet. So thank you very much. But I think the strength of the tools lies precisely in the fact that they have this mathematical or this algorithmic nature to them. And the same as, you know, building an, an algorithmic expression of something, uh, you have to define what it is in relation to. In other words, what LCT does for us and why all the engineering lectures that I work with, Celebrate, for example, and, and other spaces have so taken to it, is that it's really strengthened. It's the whole, you know, the the syntax and grammaticality of expressions that one would see in mathematics and in computer science, for example, or in the other visual or graphic, graphically demonstrable spaces we work in. Um, that's precisely it. And what Carl was saying earlier about, you know, at, at the level of abstraction that we're talking about when you have to explain using words what they are, I mean, those words are really important. But because it can be reduced so usefully, once you've defined what your terms in your expression mean, that's when the real power of these, of, of all the instruments, but I think, you know, the others are more obvious, as Carl said earlier, you know, semantics, you can, you can see it and you intuitively relate to things like up, down and motion and movement. And I think the challenge with autonomy, and because people are experimenting with it in different ways, on the one hand, what's challenging is defining what target and non-target is, for example, in the way you have. But on the other hand, its autonomy is really demonstrating, the same as the epistemic semantic devices, the, at a nuts and bolts micro nitty gritty level, 
this algorithmic explanatory power of what these tools can do for us. I just wanted to make that comment. And that it's useful that it comes from the field of computer science and hence this, you know, highly developed iterative algorithmic explanation of what it is you're trying to capture that the data is telling. That's it from me, thanks. That's useful, yeah, thank you. So how oh, about Thomas, it Tom, just, just, just jump in, tell us. <laughs> just jump in. Okay, so well, it, this isn't exactly on the topic of the of presenter's talk, so I apologize. But since we're talking no, about no, it, no, 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 please do oh, just jump thank in. And talk fascinating about talk, by the way, Janet. Apologies, <laughs> um, but uh, I was wondering. With this talk of autonomy, perhaps this is something I'm missing from my reading yet. But um, is there a way when you have the um, target? Uh, and you're talking about the target of something from the same, basically two data sets with ostensibly the same target, but with a difference in the PA and RA. Uh, so I've got, uh, I'm analyzing EFL classroom data, I'm here in Japan, uh, and uh, two different courses, um, but the PA and R, the PA and R, the PA at least seem to be, seem to be different. I'm not sure about the RA yet. I'm still in the deep in the in the midst of analysis, so I'm not sure. And I'm wondering, okay, maybe these are actually two different tar targets, in which case I'm going to have two separate translation devices. That's been my hypothesis so far. Can you um, give a little bit more? Can you give a little bit I'm, more? Um, um, but I'm wondering, filler, okay, Thomas, more to, empirical to, so we can filler. Follow. Yeah, so we what, can what follow do you mean? what you mean. Well, what I, I'm not quite sure. What um, just a little bit more. Um, what you mean by like uh, you know the kind uh, of the different constituents and different PAs in your particular? Okay, um, so you know I'm sorry, I probably should. Okay, one moment. Okay, so PA probably is going to be okay. One is going to be say so again. These are both uh, EFL classes, so. I was thinking that the positional autonomy, I think, uh, one PA is going to be the position of the L2 English, the, the, the target language English versus the um, students uh, L1, uh, in this case, Japanese. Uh, that's going to be uh, positive or negative. Not to say that, that Japanese using the L1 is negative, but that that is not the target uh, in that regard. So just to make that clear to everybody. Um, that seems to be different in the two different classes that I'm in. In one class, there doesn't seem to be as much orientation towards using English. The target of the class uh, seems to be something else, and I'm not sure yet, but they're both English classes. That's what I'm thinking. The RA think, in terms of I, the content I think this is sounds like a, a good basis of a discussion. I think you should get in, in touch with uh, um, uh, Ken and his colleagues at um, uh, LCTQ in um, Brisbane, they, uh, do, do you know their work? Like, uh, yes, I do. And, yes, I yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very familiar yeah. with their work. But I'm wondering, that are sounds these... sounds like are, it dovetails well with that, yeah. Okay, can you have the autonomy? And again, I'm, I'm still very in the midst of analysis, so that's why it seems uh, scattered, so apologies. But um, is it possible to have either a sort of meta level to look at two different things that are within the same rough field or are we again again i'm again my initial hypothesis is that they are two different um targets i, I, so, well, two I think about translation i think devices. it's I, I think it's almost impossible or, or am I too for vague, me to, too vague just no, i think it's almost impossible for me to answer that in like in in a sentence without you know with some without some examples and so on so what i'm going to suggest is that it sounds like one of the things that's come out from janet's round table is that we might want to uh we can do it by the uh through the email forum is that we might want to organize uh, a meeting, a chat online um, in one of the weeks when we don't have a round table, we can do it about the same time or roughly then. And uh, for a few people who are interested in just talking about their, their, how they're grappling with autonomy. So that might be something we could do then and we could just go, we could get more into it. Uh, if I give you an example, if I try to give you an answer now, I would never clue what I'm saying without hearing more about what you're, you're meaning by that. So. I think, but it's, it sounds very much like your question is brilliant because it's made 
on top of what Nat is talking about earlier on and Janet, it sounds very much like we could probably do with a bit of a, a chat about or, you know autonomy as a session. Um, and I had toyed with the idea of having a kind of session in non uh, roundtable weeks where you know I can come online and chat to people about. Well, I wasn't really sure what it was going to be about. Um, you know, my uh, my love of uh, of the streets, just a <laughs> a band that no almost no one outside of Britain probably has heard of. Um, but uh, or whether it be you know my former career or whatever, or actually something more relevant, like autonomy. So I think the first one will be on autonomy. So if somebody like Janet or Natalie or yourself, Thomas, wants to get onto the, uh, you know, email me directly and then we can get off, we can fix the time and then we can also get, you know, anybody else who wants to pop along and come along and we'll set up a Zoom session for that. How does that sound? Brilliant. Great idea, thank you. Great. Yeah. That's brilliant, Dan yeah. And Daniel's also said great. Corinne said great. Okay, right, good. Um, so I think that's the first one. And then what we'll do is we can also figure out, um, I might, you know, if that goes okay, then I might do more sort of, you know, workshoppy type things like that where people can bring along their problems or their issues. This is one of the things that um, I've really, uh, I think has been missing because of COVID is that I would normally have gone overseas two or three four times in the last year and spent many 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 hours working face to face with you know phd students and scholars on these sorts of issues often in groups or maybe one to one and i haven't been able to do that so i think it's about time we started doing that maybe online while we wait so but we've run out of time now so thank you janet thank you Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for that. Really that was really interesting to hear what you're up to, and 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 I also think it's great because what it's done is you've you've um, you've um, you know made it clear that um, I didn't realise that anybody was. I would <laughs> anything I ever create, I always think, well, no one's ever going to use that, and um, and Jagen will tell. You, he's not here today, but Jagen will tell you for a fact that when I finish the when we finish the epistemic semantic translation device, so the semantic density translation device, uh, device is, uh, yeah, 25,000 words of, um, of, of ridiculousness. Um, I told him I, a number of times, no one's ever gonna read this, let alone use it, but I, did, I wanted to write it anyway. And then it's the same thing with any of these things, like autonomy tours and so on. I thought, well, you know, you never know, no one's probably gonna use that, but turns out people are, and we've heard from Janet about how she's using it, which I think is really interesting. And there was a really interesting point from Paul uh, Paul Curson in the UK earlier on about how um, uh, something I can't remember the exact details, but something about apprenticeships and about who was making the decision uh, for him uh, in his context. So that's great. Uh, that was really interesting. And um, it sounds like Natalie, you connected up as well um, with what you're doing. So I think that's great. So thank you so much, Janet, for that. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, I did. Yeah, it's been fantastic, really. It's the first time I've presented this work, you know, to an audience to get feedback. So, you know, I mean, am I doing it right? I mean, that's the thing. Well, you're not doing it wrong. Um, is you're, you, you know, you're doing well. And what we can do is we can get in some, some finer grained questions that you have in our workshop as well. Yeah. But you're yeah, not, that would be really you're useful. not a million miles off the target, so to speak, to use the word target in a different way. <laughs> um, so well done. And well done you also for putting your hand up and say, yeah, I'll do a round table. Um, and I was talking with a former PhD student last night and, and he was saying, um, and I dragged him to the first ever LCT conference when he was an honor student. And, um, and uh, it was always, um, when I had a big cohort, which I don't have now, but it was always my uh, way of working would, to, would be to blood PhDs and get them out and do get them presenting from day one, if possible. And the same with new scholars, just get out there and try it. So try, fail, try, be, try again, fail better. And the more often you do it, the better you get and the more you feedback you get and so on. So I think it's really good. Thank you, Janet, for doing that. And a lot Thank of people you. want to hear about Thank your work. You. And we've also decided that we're going to do this session, which I think is really interesting. Um, and I'm looking forward to when um, we get to hear, you know, we get to see the finished product as well from you, Janet. 
Um, that'd I'm be looking awesome. forward to that as well. <laughs> thank you for thank you for doing this at what is a heinous time of the day back in Blighty. <laughs> the sun's up now, so it's not that bad. <laughs> the sun is up in Staffordshire. I don't believe it, um, but. There you go. So thank you everybody for being here today and I look forward to, I hope to see as many of you as possible in two weeks time. So thanks Janet. You want to cut thank it now? You. Mauricio, thank you Mauricio.